Thank you very much and good afternoon to you all, ladies and gentlemen. It's a pleasure and an honor to be here. I have spoken here before, but not on this subject, and frankly, I never thought I would have to speak about this subject, but okay. Here we are. Um, we are entering, I think, a new stage in the discussions with the United Kingdom about uh, uh, the preparation for the referendum on membership of the European Union. We have recently completed uh, a round of discussions with each other member state individually, so we are beginning to have a pretty clear idea of uh, the positions that uh, governments uh, across Europe are taking. Uh, and we have the letter uh, from uh, the British Prime Minister to the President of the European Council of the 10th of November, which sets out uh, the British government's uh, negotiating points uh, and issues. And uh, we are assisting, trying to help in the process of uh, resolving uh, those issues uh, so that uh, the uh, British Prime Minister can call uh, the referendum. Uh, and we hope uh, uh, that the British people will decide to remain in the European Union uh, and uh, then uh, we can remain united uh, in the face of the very considerable challenges facing Europe at the moment. We are, of course, well aware, and I think this is the case, uh, the length and breadth of Europe, of the uh, particular implications of all these debates for this country, uh, with its geographical, economic, historical uh, ties uh, to the UK. Uh, the Irish uh, government, its officials, its uh, diplomats uh, spare no effort in telling us that uh, and no doubt are telling uh, their counterparts in, in European capitals uh, that as well. Uh, and I think that in London and no doubt in Belfast, in Cardiff and Edinburgh too, uh, people are well aware uh, of that Irish uh, voice uh, coming across. This is ultimately a domestic decision, of course, for the British people. The Commission will not campaign. Uh, foreign governments will not campaign. Uh, but uh, uh, there is no doubt that the rest of Europe has uh, a very, very major stake uh, in, uh, in the outcome of the referendum. To what extent this negotiation and the four categories of issues which the Prime Minister uh, sets out in his letter will be decisive in the referendum when it comes, frankly, nobody knows. Uh, I think it's well known, and you have a lot of experience in this country, that in referendums, uh, people sometimes answer the question, sometimes bring to bear on their answer to the question other issues, uh, and therefore the outcome of a referendum depends to a certain extent on the circumstances at the time uh, of the vote. We don't know when that will be. Uh, and, and we don't know whether these particular issues are uh, all the fundamental preoccupations of the British people. Nevertheless, we have to take at face value uh, what the Prime Minister tells us. These are the issues uh, that he wants uh, to be resolved. And they break down into four general categories, uh, which are the relations between uh, the uh, Euro countries and the non-Euro countries within the European Union, what is called economic governance. Uh, the second issue is called competitiveness. The third, sovereignty, uh, essentially uh, the notion of ever closer union uh, and the role of national parliaments. I will return to that. And the fourth issue, which we think about as free movement and welfare, but is called by the Prime Minister immigration, uh, uh, which uh, we tend to use more generally uh, in thinking about what uh, happens between Europe as a whole and the rest of the world, and not movement of people around uh, the European Union, the movement of uh, citizens of the European Union. Now, some of these issues are easier than others, which of course means that some are harder than others, some are particularly difficult, uh, and uh, we don't have a great deal of time uh, if the referendum is to be held in 2016. Uh, time is rather short already. Uh, but 
uh, the referendum may be held in 2017. That is the uh, uh, political commitment uh, by uh, the Prime Minister. By the end of 2017, there will be a referendum. I think it's well known that 2017 is not an easy year in European politics. There are general elections in France, presidential, uh, presidential elections in France, uh, federal elections in Germany. Uh, and the United Kingdom happens to hold the presidency of the European Union in the second half uh, of 2017, which would be pretty hard to conduct uh, if uh, you had a referendum in the offing with uh, civil servants uh, operating under PERDA rules, uh, unable to advise their ministers. Perhaps, actually, ministers would do very well without advice from civil servants. Who knows? Uh, we, we overestimate our importance. But uh, uh, it, it would be tricky. So... We'll see. The only thing we know for certain is that it will take place by the end of 2017. The legislation calling the referendum is pending before uh, the Houses of Parliament in Westminster. Uh, and there are great debates about, for example, the voting age. Should the voting age be reduced to 16? So should 16 and 17-year-olds be allowed to vote as they were in the Scottish referendum? Uh, but have never been allowed to vote in a uh, nationwide uh, uh, election or referendum before. Um, there are all sorts of arguments about that. I frankly shudder to think how I would have voted on anything at the age of 16, but uh, uh, I was a particularly immature teenager, no doubt. Uh, they must have changed over the years, although well, I won't go into that. Uh, but the... Um, uh, there's a fundamental problem in uh, that we don't have an electoral register with the 16 and 17 year olds. And unlike many other member states, uh, but perhaps not unlike this one, we don't have uh, identity cards and a national register of everybody, which makes it very easy to find the 16 and 17 year olds. We have to go out and look for them, advertise uh, the existence of this possibility uh, to join the electoral roll. The electoral commission will no doubt require uh, a certain period of time for all that to take place, this could be a delaying factor uh, in the referendum if the House of Commons accepts the amendment of the House of Lords and this becomes law. So there are all these issues which are still uh, a little bit up in the air and before the legislation is actually uh, enacted, we will not know exactly uh, the circumstances of, of the referendum. We know the question, it's no longer yes or no but it's remain or leave. That was also the Electoral Commission's uh, doing, and the House of Lords am amended the bill accordingly, and the government has said it would accept that in the House of Commons. Uh, but we don't know the electorate, and we don't know the timing, obviously. Um, the first issue, euro and non-euro. Um, we have had, uh, in the last couple of years, the experience of creating the banking union. Uh, the banking union, which today is coterminous with the Eurozone, so only Eurozone members are part of the banking union, uh, but it is open to any others who want to join, um, and creates a supervisory mechanism in the European Central Bank uh, and a resolution mechanism for banks uh, and, and other uh, relevant financial institutions. In the course of those very complicated negotiations in which I uh, uh, was involved, we faced the difficulties of uh, how do you build something for essentially the euro area uh, alone uh, within a single market, uh, uh, which today includes nine uh, countries which do not yet have the euro as their currency. And we found various solutions. No discrimination provisions were written in. Uh, we face the problem that there is no euro area budget, so the euro, the, only the EU budget, which is the only one we have, can be used for certain purposes, even if those purposes relate solely and exclusively uh, to euro area or banking union business, and we found solutions based on pro rata compensation uh, in that context. Those rules that we found and arrangements we found can be codified, of course, uh, into a set of principles governing relations between the euro area uh, and uh, the member states which do not have uh, the euro as their currency. So I think that 
uh, that is an area where some constructive work is perfectly possible, building on what has already been done, uh, and with goodwill on all sides, and I've no doubt that it exists, uh, we should be able uh, to uh, set out a body of principles governing the relations between uh, the Euro area countries and the others. The British outlook on this, uh, uh, and the British have become fervent supporters of Eurozone integration, uh, is that the Eurozone is bound to integrate further what Chancellor Osborne calls the inexorable logic of the single currency, uh, and uh, that therefore there will be a deeper integration among the Euro area countries. Uh, uh, that is, after all, the thrust of the recent Five Presidents report on which work is now beginning, uh, and it is also the outlook of the British government, of course, that the United Kingdom will not join it. Uh, and that therefore this is a, an issue which will continue to be important, and that importance is enhanced by the fact that the City of London is, of course, Europe's major financial centre, and it happens to be situated in the country which is saying it's not going to join uh, the euro or uh, the banking union. So uh, that is uh, a first set of issues of considerable importance, perhaps not on the doorstep uh, in, uh, in democratic uh, politics, in an election or in, the, uh, or in the referendum, but obviously important uh, for uh, the financial sector, which, as you know, plays a very important role in the, in the British economy. The second, and perhaps the easiest of the four categories, is competitiveness, where uh, the British government uh, wants to see things like scaling back unnecessary legislation, supporting economic growth, and by the way, acknowledges that the new European Commission under President Jean-Claude Juncker is doing uh, exactly that. Uh, and uh, uh, a lot of this simply, I think, uh, requires explanation and co communication about the new focus of the European Union on growth and jobs, uh, 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 the new trade strategy uh, that we set out uh, a few weeks ago, which the British government welcomed, uh, and uh, the commitment to the uh, European Union single market uh, with uh, uh, its free flow of capital, goods, and services, as the British letter says, to which, of course, we would add people and workers. But I'll come to that in a minute. So uh, competitiveness is something, who could be against it after all, uh, that uh, uh, is, uh, I think, uh, uh, an issue which does not require uh, new measures, uh, new legislation. Uh, it requires just a lot of hard work in doing all the things that we should be doing and say that we're doing and have been doing uh, and making them as effective as possible in the EU uh, centrally and uh, in each of its member states. The third issue is called sovereignty. Uh, is divided into three uh, subcategories, the first of which is the notion of ever closer union. Now, ever closer union is an expression which has been used in the European treaties from the very beginning, in our accession treaties, uh, and is still in the EU treaties today. Uh, it is not uh, a legal basis for integration measures, uh, it is not, in fact, a legal basis for anything. Uh, it is not a commitment to relentless uh, further integration between states and governments. It is a commitment to ever closer union among the peoples of Europe. And as I said earlier uh, in, uh, in your parliament, the best demonstration I've seen of ever closer union recently was English football fans seeing La Marseillaise at Wembley last week. That's ever closer union among the peoples of Europe, uh, a sense of common destiny, challenge, uh, and solidarity. But as British ministers uh, remind us, in the UK, it has come to mean something else. It has come to be associated with what I say it's not, uh, which is a relentless drive to further integration. And therefore, it needs modification, explanation, 
uh, it needs to be reconciled with uh, the British position, which is one of uh, having already today a whole series of special statuses inside the European Union, no Schengen, no, uh, uh, no Euro, uh, opt, uh, uh, opt out mechanisms for um, justice and home affairs and so on. Uh, you can make a whole list of British protocols and, and special rules, all of which is compatible with the notion of ever closer union among the peoples of Europe. That is a fact today, but that no doubt can be explained better uh, and uh, the European Council, the heads of state or government of our member states, uh, can no doubt find ways of uh, making that uh, abundantly clear. The role of national parliaments is the second of the sovereignty issues, and this has been a long-standing uh, uh, discussion in European politics over the years. How should one uh, bring national parliaments uh, into the European public debate and into the decision-making process uh, without in any way undermining the role of our common shared European parliament. Here, the idea seems to be that if a considerable number of national parliaments uh, object to a proposal on subsidiarity grounds, uh, something should happen. How many and what that something should be will have to be a subject for discussion, but it seems to us very likely that if a large number of national parliaments doesn't like a proposal because they think it is uh, incompatible with the notion of subsidiarity, uh, it is very likely to follow that a large number of national governments will take the same view. So perhaps the focus should be on what happens in the Council of Ministers if uh, that happens. And that is what we are beginning to think about, uh, and uh, uh, I think it should be possible to find some suitable arrangement. The third uh, sovereignty point uh, is uh, the UK uh, uh, will need, I quote, will need confirmation that the EU institutions will fully respect the purpose behind the JHA protocols in any future proposals dealing with justice and home affairs matters. I don't think that should be very difficult. I'm sure uh, the EU institutions will and do respect the purpose uh, of, and certainly the wording of, uh, the uh, protocols uh, in this area. What lies behind this is concern about uh, the choice of legal basis for certain um, proposals, uh, and there has indeed been uh, recent uh, uh, litigation in the Court of Justice on these matters, but I think uh, the necessary confirmation and reassurances uh, should be possible. That brings me to the final uh, basket, as we say, category of uh, British requests, which is uh, entitled immigration, and we think of, as I said, as one of free movement. Now, what has happened in the last uh, 10 years or so uh, is that in several member states, including the United Kingdom, there has been a large uh, influx a largely unpredicted, I have to uh, say, of uh, workers from other member states. As a result, no doubt, of the recession and labor markets responding in the way uh, uh, they do. Uh, and uh, there's no point in hiding it as a result of the enlargement of the European Union, the fact that the United Kingdom and Ireland, I believe, did not use the seven-year transitional period uh, uh, to delay the entry into force of free movement, whereas uh, many other member states did, therefore creating some sort of displacement effect. Now, why people move from one country to another, uh, and you uh, Irish have considerable experience with this, often tragic, is uh, uh, made up of many different motivations. Uh, people move for many different reasons. Uh, the question which the British letter asks us to focus on is whether, uh, uh, what is the role of incentives created by uh, social security systems? And uh, the focus of Mr. Cameron's letter is on 
uh, the role of in-work social security benefits as they operate in the British system, in particular uh, in respect of uh, low-paid uh, service sector jobs where uh, incomes are essentially topped up by uh, a combination of different social security benefits, which, by the way, are being merged into one so-called universal credit system in domestic reforms taking place in the UK. That's relevant because the UK itself has a moving target of uh, social security reform going on at home at the same time as it is seeking to marry this to uh, the European system in this complicated political climate. So the question is, uh, put by the letter, uh, can uh, foreigners uh, be, uh, by which is included non, uh, uh, well, other citizens of other EU member states, can foreigners be uh, obliged to wait four years before having in-work uh, benefits uh, while the British worker alongside them in the factory, in the office, wherever it is, doing the same job, paying the same tax, uh, has immediate access to those benefits. That looks very like discrimination and uh, therefore poses very serious problems under the single market rules uh, which uh, proscribe uh, uh, discrimination in respect of goods, services, capitals, and labor, capital and labor. Uh, so we have a considerable uh, political and legal uh, task ahead of us in the discussions with the British, and that certainly came through in the discussions with the other member states, about how uh, you can uh, uh, run your social security system uh, in a single market. The basic rule in the EU is very simple. Member states have their own social security system, then they make their own social policy choices, but once they've made them, they uh, apply them to all EU citizens in the same way. That's what we have to find a way of doing, of reconciling. Uh, I can't pretend that that is easy. I think, in fact, it is uh, the most uh, difficult of uh, all these issues. Let's assume, let's be optimistic for a minute and assume that we find answers to all of these questions put by Mr. Cameron. What form will uh, the answers take? Uh, the European Council will, I think, be the forum in which uh, the resolution will be found. Uh, so where the leaders all come together. Their next meeting is on the 17th and 18th of December, which in Brussels time is tomorrow. Uh, when you consider uh, that we have to give them papers in advance that they can look at, analyze, uh, uh, talk to their advisors about, and so on and so on, perhaps talk to their parliaments about before coming to Brussels. Um, so that's a pretty tight schedule, and as I said, we don't have answers to all of these questions today. The next European Council after that scheduled is in February, uh, and uh, I have to say my hope is that uh, at the very latest then we reach a resolution uh, enabling Mr. Cameron uh, then uh, to uh, consider, announce uh, the date uh, of the referendum, and then the campaign proper uh, in the UK uh, will start. Um, the legal form this will take depends on the content that you want to put into it. Uh, some people say to us, uh, will there be a, I'm anticipating the questions you'll like to ask me, will there be a new treaty? Well, there certainly won't be a new treaty anytime soon. European treaties take a long time to negotiate. Uh, they then take often an even longer time uh, to ratify and to bring into force. Uh, and I have to say that talking to uh, uh, colleagues across Europe, I don't sense any great appetite to embark on a great treaty change exercise immediately, uh, given all the other challenges facing 
uh, Europe and its leaders at the moment. I come from a city which has been on high security alert, essentially locked down for the last 72 hours. Uh, uh, and that's only one example of the dreadful challenges we face, something, again, I never thought I would see. So um, we will have to see uh, precisely what the heads of state or government in the European Council can agree amongst themselves by way of decision. That decision may well be in the form of an international agreement between them, so an internationally binding legal agreement between them to do certain things. Uh, we have had experience of, uh, uh, in the case of both Ireland and Denmark, uh, of uh, uh, dealing with particular national issues, albeit in a different context, uh, by uh, uh, a decision of uh, the heads of state and, or government in the, in the European Council. Will European legislation be necessary? Uh, can't be ruled out. Uh, it takes a long time, can take a long time, uh, and the Commission can only propose it. We are not masters of the final outcome, uh, nor, of course, are ministers in the Council, because legislation also requires uh, uh, the full uh, participation and co-decision of the European Parliament, so that is an unpredictable uh, process, both in time and in content. Uh, to give you one example of where legislation may be needed, and I should have mentioned this perhaps, uh, and this will be my last point, uh, another of the welfare issues raised by the uh, British government is child benefit. Child benefit in Europe today, under European regulation, is paid by the state uh, to the parent worker, wherever the children may be. So I am working in Ireland, uh, uh, I'm entitled to child benefit, I get the child benefit because I'm working in Ireland, uh, and the Irish do not uh, ask me, well, where are your children? They may be here or they may be back at home. Uh, the British government says, that's unfair, we have lots of Eastern and Central Europeans working in the UK, uh, some of them leave their children at home for various reasons, it's far cheaper to raise a child uh, back there than it is here, so why don't they pay, Romania, Bulgaria, Poland, wherever it is, why don't they pay the child benefit, not us? Uh, that's, I don't think, likely to be popular, acceptable uh, at all. A possible compromise is an indexation system. You apply a weighting factor. You say, uh, I'm the British worker here in Ireland, uh, I go along to get my child benefit. The Irish say, where's the child? I say, it's uh, he, she is back in uh, London. They say, oh, London, very cheap to raise children in London. Uh, uh, we look at, yes, uh, uh, we look at uh, some pre-agreed form of statistical analysis, purchasing power, GDP, whatever you want, and we apply uh, a percentage to it. Um, that's possible. Uh, there are all sorts of problems with it, complicated. The numbers, frankly, are not enormous. The administration of such a system would not be easy. There would have to be constant reviews as the uh, relative GDP or wherever it is, purchasing mm -hmm. power parity is changed. Uh, uh, but it could be done. That would require legislation. We could, not saying we will, we could propose it, but it wouldn't be ready uh, uh, in time uh, I think, before uh, a referendum, whenever uh, a referendum took place. So we will find ways to do what uh, the leaders agree that they want to do, uh, and our hope is uh, that, to a sufficient extent, the British Prime Minister's uh, hopes and requests are met, enabling him to campaign for... Uh, the United Kingdom's remaining in the European Union, and we also hope, but we have no control over that, and I don't even have a vote because I've been away too long, we hope that the great British people uh, will vote to stay in the European Union, uh, and that all the uh, predictable and unpredictable consequences uh, of uh, the other option uh, do not need to be faced. Thank you. <laughs>